Coming up on Tech News Today, Zappos gets hacked. We'll tell you what you need to worry about if you need to worry. Sopa's on the ropes, but it's not quite dead yet. And good news and bad news for Linux users wanting to use machines that came with Windows 8. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, January 16th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Collaborate face-to-face -face remotely with GoToMeeting with HD Faces. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com and use promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to take some of that tech news and make some sense out of it. Joining us today from GeekBeat TV host Callie Lewis. How's it going, Callie? Doing great. How are you? Except for this, the yeah. voice. We're all, Not so well. <laughs> we're all recovering from CES. You were, you were working hard out there at the uh, Panasonic booth. You had us on, on your show there, me and Eileen Rivera. Yep. Uh, at the Qualcomm booth, too, uh, you were talking about. So you're, are you recovering? I'm, I feel very rested. For once in my life, I took a weekend off. And um, so the only thing left to recovery is my voice. <laughs> Do you think it's all worth it, the whole CES, like, trial that we yeah. all put we, ourselves through? We put through. Our th ourselves through a lot. Um, all of us, we do. I think it, I think so. I mean, it is by by far the most stressful time of year for all of us. But um, I think it's worth it. I mean, it, it's so much fun. I don't think... I <laughs> If I didn't have you know, so much feedback from all of our fans and, and audience on Twit saying, good work, loved loved everything, I might be like, do we really need to do this next year? Yeah, we did good. Because my feet hurt pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> but everybody seemed to like it, so that's why we keep doing it. Well, luckily, I had comfortable oh, shoes, sorry. so I enjoyed it. That's fine. <laughs> You didn't wear heels, did you? No, I didn't. For did what? No, yeah, normally I do. You. <laughs> I can't see it on the set. Not I you, normally I wear heels, but not I did, Kelly, show. and the reason is because... Anybody who's seen our little acceptance um, speech at um, at the IAW yes. TV Awards where I'm like four feet below everybody else, <laughs> that's me in heels. If I don't wear heels, it's even weirder. I had no choice. We have to carry her on Congratulations, our guys, by oh, the way. We were you. sitting uh, yeah, right yeah, in you know, front of you. We can, we can put this thing yeah, up. Yeah, we can get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to be a little obnoxious. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's start off with uh, Zappos getting hacked. 24 million customers apparently affected. Uh, they sent emails out. I got one of these emails that personal info had been accessed on the Zappos site uh, because a server in Kentucky was hacked. Uh, the, the hackers got email addresses, billing and shipping addresses, phone numbers, last four digits of consumer credit card numbers, as well as the passwords, although the passwords are encrypted. Now, I haven't seen anywhere where they say how they were encrypted. Were they salted? Were they hashed? I don't know about that, but they were encrypted. They don't don't expect that your passwords will be accessed, but they're going to act as if they would be. Uh, so they have reset everyone's passwords at Zappos, and they have shut down their phone lines, uh, which Zappos is, you know, unparalleled customer access. You mm -hmm. call them, and, and they bend over backwards. That's, that's a huge departure from their policies to do that. Well, they said something like if 5%, which is a low number of, of everybody who was a Zappos customer, called in, that would be 1 million phone calls, most of which would never get through because right. the system would, you know, have a meltdown. So in a way, it's instead of some sort of, a, you know, hours-long wait or frustration of not being able to get through, they just said, listen, we can't accommodate anybody right now. Credit card I can no understand why they did that, but do you think it's going to hit them hard in terms of their reputation, or have they just built up so much of a good reputation that it's going to be fine ultimately? It, it kind of remains to be seen. I got my email today, and it was a very good email from Tony Shea. It was very apologetic. It wasn't you know, making any bones about it, gave information, told me the server in Kentucky was hacked, gave me a lot more information than I would normally get from these sorts of emails. Uh, 6pm.com users, by the way, affiliated site, also hacked in this, so they're getting the same email. Credit card numbers were not stolen, so you know, I got some yeah. some good feeling about that but the one thing it said was what we need you to do we're you know we're really sorry we have to do this but we're shutting off our phone lines we will support you through email and twitter uh but go to our website 
upper right corner, click on reset password and go from there. So I did that. Put in my email address and said, yep, your password's on your way. Now, a lot of people are, are asking for password resets right now, so it may take up to 30 minutes. I still haven't got my password reset. And this was when? This is this morning at 9.30 a.m. Okay, so. Oh. Well, to Callie's point, I think I think this Zappos has been so good so consistently over mm -hmm. years. You don't really hear stories of them screwing up very often. They don't have, like, a Netflix backlash or anything like that. Sure. So I think they'll be able to survive this because I can imagine they're going to be saying, okay, like, here's, like, a free $25, like, some kind of coupon or something to make up for this in the long run. I'm such a jerk. Why didn't I look at my email? Of course, six minutes ago. There you go. I got, <laughs> I got the password reset. But it definitely took more than 30 minutes. Well, they are swamped. Yeah. Uh, so, so be patient. Uh, yeah, it says you requested Zappos password to be reset. Click on the link. It's, it sounds like this is just the What's your new link. password, Tom? Oh, it's <laughs> going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. This oh, time. much okay. safer. Ooh, that's, that's very good. What did get access, though, were people's names, addresses, phone numbers. So it's personal information that that's maybe even more than just an annoyance for some people. And I believe the last four of um, uh, credit, credit card numbers as well. So not enough to have anybody start charging up your card, but it's a privacy issue. And you yeah. also have to make sure that if you have similar passwords in case they do, they do get hacked, change those other passwords. That's yes. like, a, it's a, just a simple thing. But if you have on. anything that's the same as your Zappos password or even similar, now's the time to update those. Just in case. You never it's, know. A, it's always good to have different password for every site. And, uh, you know, Steve Gibson, at Security Now has lots of methods for you to do that in a way that isn't totally burdensome because it sounds horrible. Uh, but you can use password managers like 1Password or LastPass uh, to manage those and then create some easy-to-remember secure passwords. There's lots of ways to do it. So it's, it's worth investigating for your own protection. The Stop Online Piracy Act uh, is faltering. It's stumbling. It's not dead yet. You may see some headlines out there that say it is, but it's not. However, Representative Daryl Issa said on Saturday that House Majority Leader Eric Cantor has promised not to take up a vote on SOPA until a consensus is reached. That means it might not get voted on this year uh, because Congress is going to be reelected in November. So if it gets pushed off long enough, it could, it could get pushed into 2013. Uh, Friday, after Tech News Today finished recording, uh, SOPA sponsor Lamar Smith announced that he would be pulling the DNS blocking provisions from his bill, from SOPA, uh, this after uh, Senator Patrick Leahy said that he would pull the DNS provisions from the Senate bill. So those bills are now matching. Six senators who served on the Senate Judiciary Committee, which, by the way, unanimously approved SOPA, or uh, Protect IP, rather, wrote a letter to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid asking him to postpone a vote on Protect IP to give them more time to study the legislation. Representative Paul Ryan in Wisconsin came out with a clear statement of opposition to SOPA after Reddit members raised $15,000 in 48 hours for his challenger in the upcoming race. Uh, and finally, responding to a petition on their website, the White House put up a blog post stating that President Obama will not support legislation that, quote, reduces freedom of expression, increases cybersecurity risk, or undermines the dynamic, innovative global Internet. So what does all this mean? It, it, the bill the tides are turning. Yeah, the, the bill has not been killed. It's been shelved. Uh, the DNS provisions have been removed for the time being. Those provisions haven't even been killed. They've just been amended for further study. Uh, so essentially, the, the, they've done everything to kind of back off the criticism of the bill without killing the bill. I mean, just, this just goes to show you, like, how upset people were about this to the point where they were contacting the representatives. I mean, the way this, this Reddit... Um, that's, I want to say scheme, that's the wrong word, but the raising $15,000 for an opponent of, of a, a politician, that's a brilliant move. I mean, th there was a huge backlash for this, and it was enough that they had to do something about it. I'm, I'm actually very happy that enough was said that people realized, hey, this is going to break the Internet. This is going to mess up things for us, and it's going to be less secure. And the fi these, these provisions being stripped out, it, it looks, well, I'm kind of happy about it. One it's of the a very good thing, obviously. I mean, I don't think... You know, it could change so much in between now and when it actually gets, you know, voted on, um, if, it, if it ever does really go that far. But obviously it's a good thing, um, but it's, I, I don't think we can just continue to sit back totally and just assume it's gone. Well, and I think, yeah, I think that's a, the key point is that what they have done is take the wind out of the sails of the opposition by... Yeah 
uh, taking away that committee meeting. In, in fact, uh, Daryl Issa said that he will not be having his committee meeting that he was going to have to hear experts on DNS because the DNS provisions have been removed for now. So that's not necessary right away. Uh, there probably won't be a vote on January 18th of, of any sort because of uh, House Majority Leader Cantor's promise not to take up a vote on SOPA. Uh, so January 18th being the blackout day has less direct meaning. It's not the same day that a, a hearing is happening. Mm -hmm. But it looks like all of the websites that are going to black out on Wednesday are continuing to go ahead and black out because they want to make it known how strongly they feel. Well, the about momentum this. for spreading the word has been pretty effective up until now. So now is not the time for people to say, oh, well, it's fine, yeah. you know, and, and stop calling their congressperson if that's indeed what they haven't done yet. So, yeah, the, I, I mean, the momentum needs to stay um, focused. And we have a few sites that are, are going dark on the 18th. We'll talk about it a little bit later in the show. But Pierre Farr, who's a Google employee uh, working in the UK, posted instructions on his Google Plus account for how to black out your site should you choose that protest method. And a lot of people are interested in doing the same thing, January 18th being a big blackout day. Uh, he says webmasters should return a 503 HTTP header for all URLs participating in the blackout. Um, he says that the fewer pages on your site, the better. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe just the front splash page. Page or, or something um, that's not uh, a variety of pages. And the reason is because it'll tell Google it's not real content on the site and it won't be indexed. And because of that, even if Google sees the same content, uh, even a site offline message on all of the URLs, it won't cause duplicate content issues. He does say that Googlebot's crawling rate is going to drop when it sees a spike in these 503 headers. And you can't really get around that because... E, that's the way it works, but as long as a blackout is a transient event, so it's an event for a short period of time, he expects that things would be back to normal within a few days. And if you're going to participate in something like this, you're making a statement, so that's just what you should know ahead of time. There's a JavaScript right. you can add to your site as well uh, out there if you just want to do it very simply rather than return the error. Uh, there's also a WordPress plugin that will allow your site still to be clickable. You'll still be able to click through, and that kind of helps with, with, the, with the SEO part of this as well. Kelly, what were you going to say? Well, I'm sorry, and I, I probably get hounded hard for this one, but I don't quite understand. I understand that it's a method of protest and that it's a method of, you know, putting your um, your thoughts out there. But almost it doesn't make any sense to me to go black out because this is exactly what would happen if there um, if the the bill went through as it as it was written before. Why not just continue to put the message out there? Why not, you know, continue to um, to be vocal about it rather than go quiet? That it doesn't quite make much sense to me. Oh, I think the point is to jar people into paying attention. If my blog looks like it does every day, and I have a blog post day after day about, um, uh, you know, my anti sopa feelings. I would hope that people would read that in detail, but if I'm completely black, you know, with a URL and maybe just a, you know, a small message, the people who weren't paying attention might be forced to. I, I think that's where people are coming from. Yeah, I mean, the idea is to say this is what would happen. It's exactly what you said, Callie. This is what would happen if, if this were passed. You might see sites disappear like this. I, I think the yeah, idea... Yeah, I, mean, I get yeah, it, but I don't get it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the idea, but, you know, probably what splits the difference is the idea of putting something up that educates people about SOPA and directs them to more information about that for a day uh, rather yeah. than just delivering a 503 error yeah, necessarily. Like it depends see, on how dramatic yeah. you want to be, though. Put, put a video out saying with just the video showing, but not not a 503 that takes your site down completely. I'd, I'd, that that part is what doesn't make sense. But it certainly know, put, gets people's put the information out there. You know, it's funny. It depends on the size of your site, right? If if I take down subbrilliant.com and put a 503, people are just going to think I didn't pay my web hosting bill. <laughs> for the day. If Google delivers a 503, suddenly sure. that's news and everybody's sure. talking about it. That could have the kind of effect people are looking for. So you know, it all depends on on where you are on the scale, I think. Uh, let's move on to Microsoft. Good news and bad news for Linux fans here. Computer World uh, pointing out a Windows 8 hardware certification requirements document that says on the one hand, on non-ARM systems, that, that pretty much is Intel systems and AMD systems, it is required to implement the ability to disable secure boot via firmware setup. This is huge news for Linux fans. If you, if you haven't been following this, secure boot means that an operating system has to have a signed digital key to run on the on the firmware to run to run on the chip, uh, but Linux distributions won't all have that signed key. So, 
giving the owner of the computer the ability to turn off Secure Boot provides a way to install Linux on machines that otherwise wouldn't be able to install them, uh, but still gives you the advantage of having Secure Boot for Windows if you want that. Here's the bad news. On an ARM system, that's a system with an ARM-based chip, like something from NVIDIA or TI, uh, it is forbidden to enable custom mode. Disabling secure must not be possible on ARM systems. So if you buy an ARM-based device that has Windows 8 on it, you will not be able to put Linux on it without some nifty hackery. This, this seems like this is kind of odd to me because you can always get an intel based tablet if you are really really want to have a tablet and then you'll be it's a non arm system so you can have linux on that if you're into linux you might be able to work do a workaround because i've seen uh, already some workarounds a, a couple of weeks ago about this so it's it just seems like it's or a your distro could have have keys that too some, so some there's all, it's, it just seems like okay this can get people riled up and they're going to get angry about it but it it just seems like this is this is so easily worked around in so many different ways that it's almost pointless I'm not sure it's so easily worked around. I mean, that's, that's, that's the problem is, is you're going to have to work around it mm -hmm. and it's going to prevent people from experimenting that might otherwise experiment. I, I guess Ed Bott was arguing too. It's like if you got a tablet with Windows 8, you're not going to want to put anything else on there anyway, right? But I, I think that ignores the point that Somebody will. People want to. Yeah, to, you can't it's generalize. Your device. Like that. You shouldn't be prevented from doing with your device what you well, want. Could you just go with the Intel version of that instead of the the well, what ARM you, version? What if you had two? You know, there's a big price difference. You'd be a bit, little bit out of shape about yeah, that. Yeah, or what if the, the 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 perfect device for you is happens to have an ARM chip? Such a ta yeah, with an ARM because it's better on battery life. Then you're gonna try to do the workaround. I mean, I'm just thinking like if this was me and I had to do this, well, I'd you're acting like the workaround is no big shakes, and I think it's that's that's a bigger deal. I mean. It, it, not everybody's going to be able to make that workaround work, uh, and it's 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 harder to do than you're making it sound. I feel like. I, I think I, I think one of the reasons I'm saying it's so easy is because the the articles I've read about the workaround that was that was in place for for this because people were originally freaked out that you couldn't even do this on Intel machines mm -hmm. or AMD machines that a workaround was done pretty quickly. I can't remember which distribution right now, so now it's, I'm blanking. But uh, I, if I remember right, it really wasn't that difficult. It was almost as simple as jailbreaking an iPhone or, or rooting an Android phone. I mean, it does take some work, but if, you're, you, know, if you want to, you're going to figure it out. Yeah, it's, it's all about roadblocks in the way, mm -hmm. right? No matter how hard it is, you know, the, the principle of this is that we should be able to easily do put software on whatever device we want rather than have this in place. Microsoft's arguing, but we want the ability to have it secure. And on a tablet, you know, we don't, I guess they don't feel like that many people really care. And so they're not going to give you the, the ability to turn it off. But why wouldn't you? Why not give people the ability to turn it off on, a, on an ARM-based processor? Maybe there's a technical reason I'm not aware of. Uh, but, but it seems like that's just random. Are they just trying to have more control like Apple does? You know, I mean, they they secure things down, even though you can do workarounds, um, jailbreak it and all that. All that, But uh, maybe they're thinking that's the better model. Yeah, I, I very well could be, Callie. I mean, it just may be on, on the tablets, they want to have that model and still use yeah. Windows 8. And that's what's causing all this confusion. So I mean, the tablet version of Windows 8 is pretty locked down. It's going to just have the Metro apps. I and mean, this is the ARM version. Right, of, right. So maybe, the, I mean, like what Kelly was saying, this is going to be a very, very controlled experience. It's yeah. just, this is all you get. If you want to hack around, this is not the right system for you. But, you should, uh, but the hacker is nice. going to say, every system should is a be. system I want to be able to hack around on. So <laughs> don't get in my way. It's my device. I paid for it. I like the challenges. All right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, GoToMeeting, uh, with a, a, a product that you may or may not have heard of called GoToMeeting with HD Faces. When you're doing meetings online, if you're just doing them by voice, it's hard to interpret people's facial expressions because you can't see their face. It's, in fact, impossible if you can't see their face. Uh, and, and being able to, to see, look people in the eye it helps our relationships. It helps the way we do business. That's why we recommend GoToMeeting with HD Faces. It lets you meet face-to-face -face from anywhere in the world. Here's how it works. Uh, GoToMeeting by Citrix takes a webcam and a click to collaborate in a group HD video. You can see your attendees eye-to-eye -eye while collaborating on documents in real time. Uh, you'll feel instantly connected even if you're 1,000 miles apart. Plus, GoToMeeting is easy to set up and simple to use. It always has been. HD Faces doesn't make it any more complicated. As long as that webcam's in there, you just click and go. Uh, we use it for meetings here at Twit. And it's been great for the folks who've used it here. HD video is so clear. Start hosting your own face-to-face -face online meetings today with GoToMeeting. Uh, you can try it for free because you're in our audience for 30 days. Don't wait. Go to meeting.com. That's where you go. 
G-O-T-O-M-E-E-T-I-N-G.com, and click the Try It Free button. When they ask you for your promo code, type in TWIT. That's go to meeting.com. Uh, <laughs> type in TNT. Don't type in TWIT. <laughs> that gives Leo's show the credit. Uh, that one works too, actually. But no, go, go to meeting, type in TNT. Uh, promo code, and you can try it out for free for 30 days. Thanks, Go to Meeting, for your support of Tech News Today. On to more Windows and Intel intrigue, Digitimes, you know, they're always talking to suppliers, and their predictions are 50 50, but they're reporting that Microsoft and Intel are holding the line on prices for tablets, meaning that Windows 8 tablets might be in the $599 to $899 range. The cheapest one would be 600 bucks. <laughs> Ouch. The problem here is that if Microsoft drops its Windows 8 price or if Intel were to drop its Clover Trail W price, that's the chip going into most of these tablets, that would cause damage to their PC market margins. So they'd start to lose money in the PC market because it's the same chips in both places. Uh, if Intel doesn't reduce its Clover Trail pr platform prices, though, vendors may choose not to use Intel. They may go use ARM solutions like NVIDIA, Qualcomm, and TI. But the Windows 8 price is still going to cause even those ARM-based tablets to be more expensive. So it's a rock and a hard place here because, because of the flexibility Microsoft and Intel built in. These are chips that can be used in multiple ways. It's an operating system that can be used in multiple ways. I don't know. They've been... Uh... They've been trying to get Windows phones into the hands of as many people as possible because, well, I mean, in a perfect world, it's because if you get the phone and it's not cost prohibitive, you like the operating system, and all of a sudden now you're a customer for a long time, hopefully for life. And probably a little bit of an evangelist, too. Exactly. Yeah. It's weird to me that it, w I, I understand that tablets are a different beast and a lot more expensive to make, and Windows 8 is a... It's, it's, a, it's a whole other thing on tablets. I get that. But it seems like it's going against what Microsoft needs to do in order to get people to like this operating system, which is an ecosystem, um, you know, like iOS is. I don't know. I, I, I just don't think anybody's going to buy a $600 stock tablet. Well, somebody will. Yeah, Not enough obviously people will. somebody will. Not, Not enough. enough people will. Yeah. If 600 bucks is the low mark for a, a Wintel tablet, that's, I mean, this is, this is what, AMD could come up with something finally. Maybe they can lower their own prices. I mean, they've been out of the competition for this kind of thing for a long time. But they're going to face the same problem, which is well, they might want to lower the price on a chip one get, place. Just, yeah, just yeah, to man. get somewhere. I mean, they, they've, right now, have, when was the last time we talked about AMD? I think we were actually mocking them last week because they haven't done anything in a very long time. And if, if Intel is very scared about hurting their own margins, okay, maybe AMD is willing to do something crazy to even get into there. Although I still think AMD should be licensing ARM architecture. Um, but $600 at the low price, well, I, don't, I don't know why you'd even go with that. I mean, th those kind of exist, existed for Windows 7 where you could get a, like an HP tablet that you'd take the screen, you'd turn it around, you could do all kinds of things. And those things didn't sell very well. So I don't know, I don't know what Microsoft's going to do because they want this to succeed on the tablet space. So... It just seems like something's got to give. Yeah, Microsoft is looking at this saying, we're not going to undermine our desktop business, and it's one operating system, so we're going to keep that price the same, and we're just going to hope that people look at the Windows tablet and feel like it's such an advantage to have full operational Windows at our command and the ability on Intel devices anyway to run uh, the programs we have on our desktop, on our tablet, that they'll be willing to pay extra. But Ka Callie, or, oh, sorry, Sarah. Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I just, I mean, I'm stating what I think is the obvious, that tablets are not replacement for any laptop, desktop, PC, notebook, ultrabook, whatever you want to call them. They're two different things. I can't do everything on, on my iPad, for example, that I can do on my laptop, on my MacBook Air. I can do a lot of things, but it's not a replacement. Yeah. Especially if you're a multitasker, they they just don't work for multitaskers. They can be replacement for you know very very basic tasks for a short business trip or something like that. But I 100% agree with Sarah. You know it's 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 not a replacement. All right, let's move on to the rumor mill. <laughs> Bloomberg reports that production of the iPad 3 began this month and will reach full volume sometime in February after the Chinese New Year. It will have a quad-core processor and LTE, 
along with better resolution and a better graphics processor. Uh, the iPad battery can handle battery drain better than the iPhone, hence the reason LTE is showing up in the iPad before it shows up in the iPhone. Mass production began at the start of January in Foxconn's Chinese factories running for 24 hours a day, according to the Bloomberg report, and they will stop temporarily for Chinese New Year, then restart in February full bore for a March release. You know, M.G. Siegler was a guest host on iPad Today when Leo was out a few weeks ago. He predicted this exactly. Now, he doesn't have any insider information. He also predicted that in order to house a quad-core processor and have LTE capability, which does make sense on an iPad more than iPhone because the battery life is so much better, but they will have to compromise by going up in thickness again. Yeah. Like more iPad 1 type of a, I mean, not necessarily going back to that, thickness but ipad 2 was remarkably thinner but you can't do, do it they, all do you think that anybody will actually have a problem with that do you think they need it to be super thin they put a case on it anyway i mean i when i just because i use my ipad 2 so often for work and 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 for personal use when i pick up a first gen ipad it does feel heavier and thick and like oh clunky but no, I, I don't think, especially if nobody, uh, if somebody didn't buy the iPad 2 because they were waiting, which a lot of people haven't. I mean, we get emails from those people all the time. Should I wait? And at this point I say, yeah, you should. I, they won't notice, I think, notice the difference. You know, it's really interesting because I always suggest to people that they don't um, buy a tablet without, you know, some kind of... Um, of data on it, uh, just pure Wi-Fi is is very hampering for a lot of people. Unless, oops, sorry, just hit the mic. Um, unless you're in a place like San Francisco, where it's pretty much everywhere. Um, but I'll, I'll be very interested to see because there are so many people who just buy the Wi-Fi version. If this will, if this version will kind of reinvigorate some people. I don't it know. Kind of, kind of depends on the pricing plan too, right? If, it, if the it plan stays it the same does. and you get LTE, I'm going to think about switching because I got the Wi-Fi because I have a hotspot, right? And I'm like, oh, I can right. just use the hotspot when I when I can't get a Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, but it's a little bit more of a hassle. It is. You have to You're make right. sure it's, it's kept charged and you have to keep yep. it turned on. And it's all another that gadget stuff. to carry around. If I got yeah. cheap LTE built right into the iPad, I might, might think about that. I'm grandfathered in to an unlimited data plan because I had an AT&T plan <laughs> uh, back in the early days. Now the AT&T is in the San Francisco Bay Area, I wonder. On the iPad? Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. I'm unlimited data. Wow. There was a rumor. Sorry, I don't mean to gloat. It's just that. <laughs> you just are. Nice, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a rumor last week. It got buried in the CES stuff. It was like a, an iPad case for an iPad that was one millimeter thicker than the iPad 2. So this would bear so that this, out. So uh, this yeah. seems to be the same line. It also makes sense why they do the iPad. You've seen, if you take apart the iPad, it's like 80% battery and a small logic board. So, I mean, it could handle all of this stuff first, and then the technology would get better, hopefully, by October for whatever iPhone, so they can build that in, too. I, I just want yeah, some ahead, serv I just want service, data service across my devices so I don't have to keep paying, you know, on top of it and top of it and on top of it. It's frustrating. Yeah, AT&T keeps teasing that. So that, that could I be know. something they unveil with the iPad as well. That would be nice that if it came cool. out this quick. Yeah. Finally, uh, Dan Lyons, uh, you might know him as fake Steve Jobs, uh, writing in the Daily Beast, uh, had a, a nice talk with Steve Wozniak and asked him what he thinks of Android. Now, remember, Woz is always first in line for the iPhone, but he also recently went to the Google campus and went and uh, got an early version of the Galaxy Nexus, took some pictures with folks. A lot of, lot of hay was made over the fact that he did that. But Woz just likes gadgets, right? So he said, my primary phone is the iPhone. I love the beauty of it. But I wish it did all the things my Android does. I really do. He, uh, he said voice commands work better on Android. Android's built-in navigation system, where the phone acts like a GPS, is another advantage over the iPhone. Uh, he cites problems with Siri since it launched on 4S, said he liked it better when it was just on the iPhone 4. But now it has problems connecting to the server. It doesn't answer questions as well. And he said he likes his Motorola Droid Razor better than the Galaxy Nexus. All of this is causing crazy headlines about Waz hating the iPhone or Waz hating Android or, you know, people misinterpreting it. But really, it's, it's just Steve Wozniak being an engineer and saying, you know what, this does this better and this does this better. And I, I like to do a little extra work and, and do things like this. So sometimes Android is better for me. I mean, Waz has been consistent about this. He's mentioned his, his, what he likes about Android before. I mean, it's been misinterpreted this way lots of times before. I mean, I've used both and they each have their own thing. I mean, Android... 
you can really customize it right out of the right out of the, out of the gate. You don't have to like jailbreak. You don't have to do certain things. You have a lot more options. And Waz just likes tech. I mean, he just anything he'll try it out. So this isn't that crazy. I mean, yeah. Crucial Wax in the chat room says what Waz really likes is having eight phones on him at all times. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like most people would feel this way about iOS versus Android OS. Many of us yes, just don't, right. we don't have the luxury of, of having two phones and two operating systems um, at one time. So you go with what you like and maybe you hear about the other operating system and you think, eh, well, it's not enough for me to switch, right? If it's a matter of switching, you tend to stay with what you know and what you like. If you have the opportunity to try out two operating systems, inevitably there'll be something where you go, oh, that's cool. I wish I had that on the operating system that I like a little bit more for these other reasons. And you can just I imagine we, Waz saying this with a smile. Oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> so huggable and lovable. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Waz is absolutely right about what's better on Android. I love both platforms. They both have their strengths. And, um, yes, voice recognition does work better. I love Siri, but she's not that useful. Um, yet. And yeah. yet. Yeah, she, she'll get there. But And I love that we still call her she. But... Um, you know, he's absolutely right. When people ask me what platform they should get, it, it totally depends on them. For, for non-geeks, iOS is better. It's just a little bit more intuitive. You don't have to dig around like you do in Android. But for people who want to dig around, it's perfect. It's great. You know, I mean, so I don't see why we all have to be um, so upset regarding each platform. Right. They're both great platforms. That's why I love, I love this interview. I'm sad that it gets reported in blogs as Waz hates this or hates that right. because what he's saying is just very sensible. He says that iPhone 4S is good for people who live in the Mac world or people who are just scared of computers and don't want to use them. The iPhone is the least frightening thing for that kind of person yeah. who is scared of complexity. Here's a phone that is simple to use and does what it needs to do. But if you want to put a little extra work, Android will do some things that iOS can't and that's fine too. They're just different the ways. As the chat room says, why can't we all get along? <laughs> I know. Good question. Peace and love. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the news fuse. Let's explode something. Yeah. Done. Hacker, <laughs> hackers made the websites of the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, several banks, and national Israeli airline El Al unavailable using denial of service attacks. No information was compromised and the sites are back up and no one has yet claimed responsibility for the denial of service attack. But Nightmare, formerly known as Group XP, is suspected to be behind the attacks. Facebook and Google faced obscenity charges today in the Delhi High Court. The government argued that the site should be accountable for content ruled offensive by the Indian government. Both companies argued they cannot control information that appears on their sites. And Google further argued it can't control websites searched by users. Google's lawyer, Naraj Kishan Kal, said there are serious constitutional issues of freedom of speech. Microsoft and Yahoo are set to join the case, and the trial will resume on Thursday. According to All Things D's sources, Facebook will likely go public in the third week of May. If that timetable is correct, the company must file with the SEC within the next month because an SEC review takes several months. The company's valuation has been estimated to be $100 billion, and Facebook may be looking to raise another $10 billion. Bad news for Light Squared. A memo by the National Space Based Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Executive Committee says that Light Squared's LTE network will cause interference with GPS equipment and that Light Squared's proposed fixes will not work. Further tests will no longer be conducted. Light Squared responded by claiming the tests were not accurate and the government is biased in favor of the GPS industry. Samsung announced its Bada OS will be merged with Intel's Tizen, the successor to Mego. All of these operating systems are based on Linux. How many buzzwords can I throw out in the next two sentences? <laughs> so developers won't have to relearn anything because Tizen is backwards compatible with Bada. Samsung hasn't announced which devices will be Tizen powered. During an interview at CES, Skype VP of Products Rich uh, Rick Osterlock, or Lost, I don't even know how to say his name, said that Skype for Windows Phone is coming out soon. Microsoft bought Skype back in October and announced plans to integrate Skype in many products, including Xbox and Windows Phone. The Verge's sources say deep integration of Skype and Windows Phone is not expected until Apollo lands later this year. Hulu's getting into the original programming business. They'll launch a new original show called Battleground on February 14th. It will be the company's first original scripted program 
and second original. It's a comedy that chronicles the life of a political candidate. Battleground will be available on Hulu's free and Hulu Plus versions. Facebook and Politico are working together to create sentiment analysis reports to show what the U.S. really thinks about the presidential candidates. Facebook will provide all messages and comments that contain a presidential candidate's name, including private ones. But before you get all freaked out, uh, Politico and, the, and, and Facebook both say the process is automated and no Facebook employees will read any posts. They're just going straight to Politico. On to patent wars. We have a patent sale. Nokia sold off 450 video and wireless patents and several applications, a patent application, to Sysvel International, but will retain a license to use the tech covered. Nokia believes some of these patents are essential for standards like 3G and LTE. Switching gears, the ITC issued an initial ruling on Friday that Motorola did not infringe on three of Apple's patents. A final ruling, ruling is scheduled for Friday. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. According to Gazelle.com, iPhone and iPad owners are optimistic, while BlackBerry users are depressed. They did a survey uh, from their booth at CES, and according to the poll, 52% of iPhone users and 58% of iPad users are always optimistic about their future, while 28% of Android users and 36% of Android tablet users are optimistic. 29% of iPhone users and 60% of iPad users expect the best in uncertain times. <laughs> uh, Gazelle found that 33% of BlackBerry users subscribe to Murphy's Law, holding the belief that if something can go wrong for them, it will. 16% of BlackBerry users hardly ever expect things to go their way. And 33% of BlackBerry users rarely count on good things happening to them. How mm -hmm. would BlackBerry users have felt five years ago? Probably on top of the world. A lot more optimistic. Yeah. This, is un this, this feels unfair because Rim has had such a tough... A tough 12 months. I'm trying to think of five years ago, there's no Android yet, right? And there's no... no. There, right. iPhone is just introduced. There's so hardly they, iPhone. Yeah. So, yeah, this, this would all be about, uh, all about, I guess, Motorola Razor fans yeah. and... Rim on top of the world. Yeah, it's looking pretty, sitting Nokia pretty. candy bar fans. I love my Crackberry. It's the best. Well, and there could be uh, correlative, not causative issues at work here. People who use a BlackBerry may tend to be in a, the financial industry mm -hmm. uh, more often than not, and therefore because of the recession may have a more negative uh, look, outlook on, on life. Or it could be positive. Maybe they were given a BlackBerry and that just depressed them. They're like, I have to have this now. <laughs> Nothing good or ever happens just, to me. They're not necessarily in the financial industry, but in the corporate world in general, even though the corporate world is starting to move away from BlackBerry. Hey, look, I got my voice back. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> the corporate world also has its stresses and it's, um, you know, a lot right, of people, right. unfortunately, aren't happy there. So... Could, could be that as well. Yeah, it, 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 there's all kinds of, of things that this could mean. Uh, but uh, Callie, what phone do you carry? I carry an iPhone. Uh -huh. I also carry my Android tab, the Samsung Galaxy tab, uh -huh. uh, everywhere I go. Okay, so, so I use both. And you're happy. You know, I'm very you're happy. Positive. <laughs> uh, I also carry an iPhone. Mostly happy. Sarah? Mostly. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm a bit of an anomaly because I have an iPhone and an iPad, which are both in my bag most times, but I am pretty down on life. <laughs> <laughs> we can always tell. I'm just kidding. I know. I, I feel pretty optimistic. I, there will always be a new app. It'll save the day, right? J Jason's Android. Yeah. He's, he's pretty I'm, happy. I'm feeling pretty happy. I'm very secure in my choice. IS yes. hates everything. Android. So yes. Except my Android phone. You have yeah. surprised you don't carry a BlackBerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have an Android phone and I have an iPod Touch and an iPad at home, so I'm pretty yeah. happy. So, I don't know. These, these, this is why we put it in a randomizer, because who knows if this means anything or not. Let's move on to the calendar. Let's. Starting today, you can get the Nokia Lumia 710 on T-Mobile for free, at Walmart anyway. Otherwise, it's uh, about $50 with a new agreement. That ought to make somebody happy. Facebook announced a January 18th event. It's in San Francisco. Invites have started rolling out. We don't know what it's about yet. Doesn't say anything on the invite. But it is being held at a restaurant bar. Uh, it's called 25 Lusk. I've been there. It's, it's not tiny, but it's certainly not as big as where they usually hold announcements at Facebook headquarters in Palo Alto. So I'm curious as to yeah. why they're doing it there. I mean, you could maybe get... A hundred people in there comfortably. 
vents, a lot smaller than their normal vents. So I don't know what's going on. They're going to off all their enemies. <laughs> <laughs> don't go. Do not go to the event. No, we, we have no idea. Uh, We're just, just going to be totally drunk. Right, right. <laughs> Just a few people. It's an open bar. Take, take embarrassing pictures and post them on Facebook. Right, right. And uh, as we talked about earlier in the show, uh, the January 18th going dark for SOPA is still gaining momentum. We, we talked last week that Reddit was going to go down for 12 hours. Uh, Boing Boing is now going dark on the 18th, as well as Wikipedia. Uh, founder Jimmy Wales says the site will go offline for 24 hours on Wednesday to protest SOPA. Um, and it's only going to affect English Wikipedia pages. So I guess if you really like Wikipedia and are bilingual or trilingual or more... Use the Spanish version. Yeah, yeah. you'll use, be okay. Use the Russian version. I don't know what we're doing here at Twit yet. Uh, there's been some conversations going around on email. Leo about, asked yeah, online we're thinking if, about it if still. people thought it would be a good idea. Um, so please let us know. All right. Let's move on to what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an email from Richard in Denver, said, I just watched episode 413, and I would like to give some input on your comments about Intel chips in Android phones. And I just wanted to point out that Android apps are coded in Java. So as long as Intel provides a JVM, uh, that's a Java virtual machine, the Android applications will run. Remember, the apps are not compiled to the chip, but to Java bytecode. That is independent of the machine code. So, yes, uh, you could run your Android. The Android operating system is going to have to be compiled for the Intel chip, but the apps themselves probably wouldn't have to be recompiled. There, there may be other issues in there the way the operating system works, but but he's right. They're, they're compiled for Java, so theoretically they should run just fine. Next email from Matt Murphy. After your segment on Viasat on mm -hmm. the calendar segment last Friday, I went to their website to check it out because my DSL only goes up to 3 megabits per second down. Their $50 package a month you talked about only allows for 7.5 gigabytes a month. And the prices in allowed a month go up from there. Doesn't seem usable to me. I actually thought about looking into it, but I won't now. Uh, it's true, Matt. We had, we had talked about Viasat's pricing some time back and mentioned that the plan is somewhat restrictive. Definitely read the fine print. Um, and there would be extra charges if you were going to use more than a certain amount of data per month. Uh, but thank you for reminding us. And VSS is really more about getting uh, high-speed internet access in areas that you are not, you don't have actual broadband penetration. So it's really helpful for people in the rural areas. Yeah. Trust me, in Vermont. We're immediately getting people in the chat room taking issue with Richard in Denver saying, no, there's some, there's some native code that you have to write for Android. The Java virtual machine is not running on Android. That's what the Oracle lawsuit is about. Uh, Android apps are Java-based, but heavy apps like games are coded directly. So some apps are what Richard in Denver is talking about are true. And it's not JVM. It's a JVM-like thing. Last email from Patrick, at and Crew. I just watched episode 415, and you were talking about the guy whose iPhone interrupted the symphony. Sarah commented that she thought that Apple should find a way to make the silent switch affect the alarm as well. I, for one, am glad that this is not the case as I use my iPhone for my morning alarm. I turn it to silent when I go to bed as I don't want emails and text messages to wake me up in the middle of the night. But I definitely want my alarm to wake me up for work. Just my two cents. Well, I do too. That's how I get up every morning too. I, I, I but it want... could be an option and setting. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe it's not a switch on the, you know, the right-hand side of the phone. But you should be able to mute your phone, including your alarm, you know, if you need to override because you're at the symphony or, or something. There's a, even else. if it's like a software thing, just yeah. give, you the, give you the option. To even if you've got to go into settings uh, manually within the software, it just seems like so, something's a little off here where you think it's your phone's muted. And it's not just alarm. There are other apps that don't work well with mute, too. All right, thanks, everybody, for submitting stories on our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, you can do that every day except maybe this Wednesday when they're blacked out. Uh, but we look at it to find out what stories you're interested in, what stories you're voting on. That's uh, just as important, if not more important, as submitting the stories themselves. Let us know what stuff you want us to cover, technewstoday.reddit.com. Callie Lewis, thank you for being on. It's great to have you on again. It was great seeing you at CES. Uh, let you folks too. know about GeekBeat TV and where they can find it. Yeah, you can get it um, almost daily show over at geekbeat.tv. Short, quick five minutes. Um, and we also have a live show every Friday at geekbeat.tv slash live. And uh, Twitter, Google Plus, all Callie Lewis. <laughs> if you like gadgets and you need to be cheered up, 
Go watch Geek Beat TV, I'm telling you. It'll, it'll change <laughs> your you, day Tom. around. Thanks again, Callie. That's it for this Thank episode you. of Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Peter Kafka from All Things D joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.